You've got to remember, I'm just a simple private detective. I deal in facts, and all you're giving me is demons and devils. Don't drive so fast! If you're afraid to meet your maker, we're all in a lot of trouble. I'm not afraid to meet my maker. I just don't want to meet him today. Welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. I am Brad. Folks, we have a listener request. Brad, tell us about our listener and their request. Okay, so a uh, friend of the show, friend of ours, uh, Mark, really, really enjoys this film. And, I, and so he mentioned it, and then he mentioned it again. And maybe he mentioned it a third time. And he had said something in, in this third mention that really, really piqued my interest, which was Brian Eno. And also because, because, because he's our friend. And so he's, he's been a really good friend of the show. So we wanted, I texted you, I said, Hey, would you want to do this? And you said, of course. So we, we both bought the Blu-ray and the indicator Blu-ray and uh, I'm not going to tell him anything about it. I'm just going to let him find out. (laughs) Perfect. Yep. Perfect surprise. Exactly. All right. It's called The Devil's Men, mm. a.k.a. Land of the Minotaur. And uh, this is a Greek horror film uh, bankrolled by British people and uh, and starring British people, which we'll get into. Um, this is directed by Kostas Karagiannis, and um, I've never seen anything else he directed. Uh, this was also uh, written by Arthur Rowe. He actually did write a few films. Oh, I missed his writing credits. What? What? He wrote The Magnificent Seven Ride, which is the final uh, in that yeah. in that trilogy of films. And he wrote uh, Zeppelin from 1971, which sounds interesting. It's about a like a high it's kind of like a heist film but it's world war one so you're they're on a zeppelin sounds interesting um michael york elka summer yeah Ooh. yeah and so then he was a producer of fantasy island having produced according to wikipedia 137 episodes writing 13 of them nice wrote kolchak episodes yes, yes. Which makes him a winner in my book hell yeah finally got that box set Yes. Nice. I love Kolchak. My dad loves Kolchak, too. Woo! All right. I have a lovely trailer for the film. So here is the trailer for The Devil's Men. Come with us, if you dare, on a terrifying journey through cells of madness, haunts of horror and fear. Come with us to this forsaken monument of crumbling stones which echoes the desolate cries of the damned. Descend with us to the forbidden chambers of the ancient pagan gods of wrath, where the devil's men perform the secret rites of the land of the Minotaur. Those who enter the forbidden chamber of the Minotaur must die. Die, 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 die. The land of the Minotaur. Donald Pleasance as the man of God who defies the dark and sinister powers that curse this land and all who venture into it. The devil has many faces. 
And many help us, too. Come on, let's get out of here. Peter Cushing as the Red Prince of Evil, who lures young lovers into the deadly embrace of the devil's men. The old customs remain, and the ancient gods live on. The old customs remain, and the ancient gods live on. stop them. No earthly power can stop them. The Land of the Minotaur, the most terrifying film of 1977, coming to this theater soon. Don't miss it. From the internet system called Google, I discovered the VHS tape from Interglobal Video. Here's the tagline on the tape. It says, Half man, half beast, trapped in a world forgotten by time. Not accurate. No, no, not at all. They were trying to pass this off with the, the art and the tagline is like a, you know, like a adventure film. Uh-huh. <laughs> no. No. But here's the plot synopsis from said VHS tape. A small village is the setting for horrifying ritual murders, demons, and disappearances of young tourists. Father Roche is aware of the evil surrounding the village, and when his own pupils begin to disappear without a trace, he sets out to uncover the cause. Black hooded figures, symbols of ancient worship, convince the father that he is dealing with a phenomenon older than mankind, a power without a face that can make people abide by its wishes. Ordinary methods cannot destroy the power that is running the village. Exorcism is the only method to destroy them. The sacrifice begins when the moonlight falls. 88 minutes. Color. Excellent. Thank you. Whew. That was my finest performance. It was up there. <laughs> whoa, 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 I got goosed by my own performance. <laughs> so, spoiler alert, folks. We're going to spoil this movie, but let me tell you, thank God we're not going scene by scene. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> We'd be here for 15 hours, um, especially trying to explain the mechanics of this film, supernatural aspects that will never be explained. Motivations. They don't have them. <laughs> but, you know. Watch the film first, so you, know, you don't get spoiled. If you don't care, then let's proceed. Yes. Some some wonderful people in the cast. Donald Pleasance. Wonderful, wonderful Donald Pleasance. You know, what was he doing before and after this, other than having a beautiful wife who has a small part in this movie? Ooh, are you serious? I did not know that. That's not gonna... Oh, yeah. His, I'll, we'll get to that when we get to nice. that. I did not know that. In 1976... Um, he had a bunch of stuff come out in 1976 because, you know, he liked to work. Uh-huh. Nothing horror-related in 1976. Except for this. Yeah. This was the horror outing that year. Interesting. Uh, the following year the following year was The Uncanny. Uh-huh. And then 1975 was <laughs> I Don't Want to Be Born, a.k.a. Sharon's Baby, which I love. You do love you. I've actually seen that film. Because you sent it to me once upon a time, and we watched the hell out of it. Oh, it's crazy. Uh, he was also in Escape to Witch Mountain that year in 1975. Wow. You know, I've never seen those films. I've never seen those. I haven't seen The Uncanny. What was he doing in 1978? Nothing. Nothing. He's retired. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> if only he'd found that <laughs> signature role. If only that could have happened for him. The next thing you know... You're at a Wendy's salad bar. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Peter Cushing. Uh, of course, you know, Peter Cushing looks like a freaking skeleton. He may have already been dead at this point. <laughs> Not sure. I mean, I love him. He brings it. He doesn't care that he doesn't know what's going on. Uh, he's excellent in this movie, as he, always. He is dressed like a boss. 
Totally. Totally. Uh, this year, uh, the year of 1976, which uh, I love 1976. Of course. He was in At the Earth's Core, Space 1999, and then the previous year he was in The Ghoul, Legend of the Werewolf, all kinds of cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Then the following year, again, The Uncanny. Well, he, so he and Pleasance paired up again. I wonder if they shared scenes because I wasn't huh. so sure that they shared scenes in this until we got way into the film. See, I'm worried about the the cats in that movie because the cats feature prominently in that film. I've not seen it. Like I'm I said, like, don't do they do they mistreat cats? I'm looking in the keyword search. Gotcha. It looks like it might be safe to watch said movie. I'm I'm getting more and more sensitive to these things. <laughs> like, right. Just because it's 1977, can't you use a CGI cat? But yeah, Peter Cushing, awesome in this movie, has a scene stealing, excuse me, a movie stealing scene in it. We'll talk about that. Donald Pleasance plays Father Roche, the hero. Well, one of our heroes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter Cushing plays Baron Corifax, the villain. Lori is uh, our, our lady pal in this movie. She's played by the very lovely Luann Peters. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Mark made mention of uh, Luann Peters. She is in some other films that we really enjoy. Uh, yeah, she's in uh, Lust for a Vampire mm-hmm. and uh, The Flesh and Blood Show. That's the one, Pete Walker. And then so I, yep, mentioned, yep. That, I mentioned that to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, we talked about Pete Walker for the next 10 minutes. And how <laughs> nice. we love, like every other year we watch all of Pete's horror films. Of course, of course you do. Uh, she had a couple episodes of Doctor Who, apparently. Mm-hmm. And she was in a very fun episode of Faulty Towers. That's how I know her. Yes, and we talked about that too, where uh, Basil tries to repeatedly turn a switch on and off. <laughs> oh boy. So, our hero, the, the alongside Donald Pleasance, is Milo, played by Kostas... Kara Georgis, which is very confusing since the director is Kostas Karagiannis. They're very similar names, these boys. Uh-huh. Um, and the the thing about the principal Greek cast in this movie is they were all prolific in Greece. Like, they all have 50, 60, 90 credits to their names. And uh, this, this Kara Georgis guy is certainly no stranger to that. When we introduce, when we're introduced to him in the plot, we will talk about this actor because we need to. This sh- this movie should have been called Milo. I mean, he's also the director, but he has two, but he has a different last name. Yeah, as far as I understand, it's the same guy. What? The director was Costas Karagiannis. right? And Costas Karagioris credited as Costas Skouris was Milo. So he directed the film. I had no, I thought it was two different people. Okay. Well, he was credited. That's, I mean, there was a reason you thought that was because he didn't want anybody to know. Ah. And he was credited under one name and he directed it. Kind of like a Paul Nashy thing. Bob Bailing, who is, he plays Tom, one of the hippies who mm-hmm. shows up. He was in one of my least favorite films of all time, Island of Death. I haven't seen it. Don't. Nope. It is... Is a video nasty. It's actually gross and actually shocking. And I strongly don't recommend it to you, especially for your tastes. I haven't seen it. And I don't plan to. He was also in the not so great Greek giallo called The Hook with Barbara Boucher. Mm. I have seen it. Which the is, hook. um, it's boring. Mm-hmm. It's very tepid. Not a fan. No, it's not very good. No. Um, next up is uh, Jane Lyle, who plays Milo's girlfriend, uh, who's not a big part of this movie, but she's got a funny moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, two funny moments. She was also an Island of Death, the poor thing. Oh, my gosh. Mira Shore, who plays the maid. She is Donald Pleasance's wife. Wow. Do you remember the maid who knocked over the thing? I do. She broke his... Um, crucifix or his cup of yes something religious wow that yeah yeah she's beautiful yeah oh my she God. was i did notice her oh my 
Yeah. And then, because she's walking out of the room after she's broken it, and she stops and looks back at him and, and has that look on her face and then just keeps walking off. Yeah, I remember her. Wow, that's great mm-hmm. trivia right there. Uh, next up is uh, Jessica Dublin. She plays Mrs. Zagros. She's uh, a character who tries to help during the movie, does not help at all. No. Uh, but this actress was in all kinds of stuff. She's in Fragment of Fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was in So Sweet, So Dead. Yep. Uh, she was in Sex of the Witch, one of the worst Gialli ever made. See, there's another. You see, you talk. I listen. I haven't seen it. You I talk, have it. I can't wait me, to rewatch it. Because you told me not to. Oh, watch it. Yep. I want you to feel my pain. No, I'm excited to rewatch it with the new really restored edition because... One of the problems I have with it is it's almost impossible to see in the old bootleg form. Gotcha. And maybe it sucks. Maybe it'll suck worse being able to see what's going on. I don't know. (laughs) You never know. Uh, But poor Jessica Dublin. She was also in Island of Death. (laughs) That's going to be our new thing. I think it was made at the same time as this. I think Island of Death was also 76. Yeah, it was. Next up, just a little bit of trivia. Um, Robert Wrighty, he's the one who voices the, the cop, Vendris. Uh, okay. Vendris is played by someone named Dimitris Bislanis. Mm-hmm. But this guy, over 230 credits to his name. Wow. Mr. Wrighty. And he had this very small part in The Omen. Oh, he was nice. He was the monk who was pushing the other monk in the wheelchair around. And he had some lines. That's mm-hmm. all I remember. Mm-hmm. Mm. monkey monk monk we're gonna try to talk about this plot and and brad and i before we started recording talked about how difficult this plot is to talk about yes because this movie is really complicated and if you categorize things as important then nothing happens in the movie right but if you want to talk about what happened in the movie you have to pull out some stuff so we did but also, <laughs> this movie's insanely hilarious. But we'll get to that when we get to that. We're going to talk about this opening sequence. Um, this introduces us, the viewer, to these evil people. Brad, who, what's going on in this freaking opening sequence? So, uh, there's some people uh, in hoods worshipping a minotaur. Which the actual story of the Minotaur, as we'll all remember from our middle school Greek mythology, is a terrible story. Um, <laughs> uh, and we discover immediately, right off the bat, that uh, Peter Cushing is the leader of these of these people. They they murder some young people. Some would say hippies. Yep. We never learn the motivation of why they're killing people for the Minotaur. Well, the Minotaur has promised them in return or has given them in the past it is there's no motivation for this killing and mark listen don't take any of this negatively because i i don't mean it negatively no nope. but but there's no mystery to this film as far as the plot it's the minotaur so, so two things about the minotaur i need to well three things one he's very mad about people coming into his, yes. his secret chamber um, he, he threatens to kill people because they've been there who have never been there. Um, he, he threatens to kill people who have been there, then he doesn't kill them. But then he doesn't talk about his followers being protected from him killing them. Like, Mm-mm. that's neither here nor there. The other fun thing is it's definitely a blowtorch being fired out of his nostrils. Right. It looks like the most dangerous prop I've ever seen. Yes. How do you grow as a cult if you if they if the if what you worship but kills you immediately? You know <laughs> I don't understand. And then the best thing is the Minotaur is anatomically correct. Yes, and you boy, you get a look at his junk over yeah. and over again. <laughs> yeah, it's made of stone, but it's still quite um, hard. Quite a, uh, quite a man. No, yes. I'm just Yes, that was you saw that all the time, and I I should have watched the other scene to even understand how they went around, how they got around all that, but I did not. <laughs> oh boy! So so Donald Pleasance as Father Roche, 
Um, he's trying to report to the authorities that people are disappearing. It's not working. And so he writes to Milo, the one and only Milo. Um, shout out to Simon. Uh, Simon, you'll get this one. It's it's not my low. It's my lol. Um, that's a little that's a little Simon joke there. And then, um, Brad, what what you wrote in your notes? <laughs> you, <laughs> you said, "I hope Milo isn't our hero." What what does that mean? <laughs> I thought he was dopey, <laughs> kind of dopey. I also, yep. I also yep. wrote because we see him. Like our first, our first scene of him is on, uh, he's with this girl and, uh, it's all, it's, she's naked, completely naked. And, uh, I, I wrote, he's like Chris Abram in Bay of Blood, but, but he, uh, he's ugly. <laughs> he looks like Father Ted. He For does look like Father are... Ted. Holy crap. <laughs> Fans of British TV. <laughs> And you know what? I regret. I regret saying that. I kept it in there because it's funny. Because I, he actually acquits himself quite nicely. Oh, that's right. He is. There's two things about this character. One, his swagger is hilarious. It's awesome. He has. He has a very unusual screen presence. And what's set up here is he's skeptical of what Father Roche is telling him. Father Roche is quote unquote one of his best friends he ever had. Right. And he's completely skeptical. And so is his girlfriend. His girlfriend is completely skeptical. Yes. All right. Who is she? Incredible. How did you guess that my pen pal wore a skirt? Give me that letter. Oh. It's just another one from that party Irish priest. Don't put him down. All right, so maybe he's gotten carried away, but he's no crackpot. He's the best friend I ever had. And he's been good to me. I owe him a lot, so lay off him. Oh, come on. These things he keeps writing you about students disappearing, being swallowed up by some ancient magic or something. It's crazy. It's medieval. <laughs> I know it sounds a little far-fetched, but... Are you trying to tell me you believe it? No. At least not enough to drop my work and go over there and help him, as he wants me to. Besides, if it's true, he can tell the police. He did. They don't want to know. Well, you can't blame them. They've got better things to do. We're going to come back to the two of them later. The, the gist is he's not dropping what he's doing in New York to uh. go flying out there. Um, has this actor ever set foot in New York? I think not. No. Negative. Go Nowhere. Shatter. Next up, we meet some fun-loving archaeologists. This is Ian, Beth, and Tom. And they show up to, to, to hang out. Uh, with Father um, Father Roche, because they're going to go on to do some exploring at these this archaeology archaeological site, and he literally tells them, "Don't go, it's dangerous." Uh -huh. But more importantly, this establishes something wonderful in this movie, Brad. Something that you pointed out in your notes: the awkward silences. What yes. is up? I don't know. There's two scenes in particular where. Dial like dialogue is given, and then everyone stands there, silent, <laughs> for, I mean, not like much longer than you than you should have. So there's a couple of scenes of just awkward silences, which really just add to the oddness of the film. Because you're like, why is anybody saying anything? Yeah, you know? it's like, did I pause the movie by accident? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> So, so they're like, he's like, why do you want to go there? What's changed? And they pull out the little bull symbol in gold, this little minotaur symbol that's going to be a recurring theme in this movie. Mm -hmm. And that's, they're just staring at it. And that's supposed to be important. It fails completely. And I love it. Yes. So next up, all these hippies, she's fine for a little while, but the guys go in to the crypt, find the, the previous corpses. And then they are captured. She goes into the town full of weirdos to do some shopping. It's just like a Paul Nashy film where two people are like, "We've come in search of this tomb that's been in that's been hidden for two thousand years, and it's just in the most likely spot." They're like, "Whoa, here it is!" And they go in. Yes, 
And that's exactly <laughs> what happens. And this film did remind me at times of an ashy film. Yes. But yeah, these, these guys found this ancient tomb real, real easily. Nice. In this town of weirdos, we meet uh, Peter Cushing, who's, who's, I wrote in my notes, Cushing of the Carpathians. That's right. Uh, he's an out-of-towner who's become a local by, uh, you know, starting this cult or whatever happened. Exactly. Um, I just love that Peter Cushing is in this and giving his best as he could with, with what he was given. Always a class act. Then Beth gets captured by something very important. She gets captured by these cloaked figures that we've been talking about. Uh-huh. And um, I, I want to talk about two things right quick. The year 1976. Right. That's the year I was born. So all movies that came out in 1976, uh, aside from Island of Death, um, <laughs> are movies I <laughs> enjoy checking out. I love seeing what was in the cinematic atmosphere the time I was plopped out on this planet. And my mom tells a story about some cloaked figures trying to kidnap me. So according to my mother, when I was two weeks old, there was a knock at the door at our house in Great Falls, Montana, and there were men in cloaks. And they asked her to give them me, her her first and only son. And she said, no, you can't have them. And they asked again, and she slammed the door in their face, and they left. And she was very unnerved by this. And when I asked her to elaborate on this story, she said, that's all I remember. I was very sick from the anesthesia they gave me when you were born. Ask your grandma. (laughs) And I never did. I never asked my grandma. That's the whole story. Oh, I, I don't no know idea. who these men I, were. I don't know where I didn't know where you were going. I assume they were production assistants on Land of the Minotaur looking for a baby extra. Absolutely. I don't know what the story is. Uh, oh, but in well, Doomed Movie Thon, the book available at Amazon.com, in my nineteen seventy six movie thon, you can yes, read all about it. I was gonna this. ask about this. Yep, yep. That's a that's a that's a story that my mother tells. Whether or not it's a true story, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't get me, but they got Beth. They took Beth away. Mm. I own a copy of every uh, book that Richard has written. Yay. And I'm sorry. I paid for all of them, I'm pretty sure, myself. I appreciate that. Yeah, there were no give me's because I support Richard. I'm s- I'm sorry for the, your loss of money and <laughs> shelf space. No, I'm staring at them right now. I can see them. Uh, but <laughs> folks, Giallo Meltdown 2... Is the best book he's written so far, in my opinion. Uh, oh, it is. Thank you. It isn't. He's always been good, but he's come a long way too. Uh, and it is. It's. It's a very enjoyable book. You really. You really got it down pat. And I know other people thank that you. have said the same thing. I appreciate that. I, I'm like Virginia Slims. I've come a long way, baby. That's right. <laughs> so Lori. Uh, before he died, um, or got kidnapped or whatever, Tom, the hippie writes to, uh, his girlfriend, Lori, and she comes a running to mm-hmm. come and join them. Um, she arrives and she's as blonde as every other woman in this movie. <laughs> she might be the blondest. Mm-hmm. Um, she is rather nude. Uh, not all the time, but you know, she's very into bathing. Brad, what happens with this bath, this pivotal bath sequence? So she gets in the bath naked, which uh, is <laughs> how you get in a bath. But uh, she gets in the bath and like everywhere, windows, doors from all sides of the room uh, are hooded figures. Opening windows, closing windows, opening doors, closing doors. It's really creepy. I love it. It's it's creepy and jarring and confusing. <laughs> it is. It's like peekaboo. We're we're here everywhere. One thing about uh, Lori that's very important to the plot is her body is not aware of gravity at this stage of her life. Mm-mm. Nope. nope. <laughs> uh, so so now Milo's getting involved again. I believe it's a phone call this time. It um, is. And he. Does Milo ever get dressed? Yes, he does, but 
his the scene with his girlfriend and this scene with his girlfriend are clearly filmed back to back or uh-huh. or right at the same time because he's naked in both of them. He's smoking cigarettes in both of them. Uh-huh. His girlfriend's naked in both of them and giving him crap about this roast stuff. It's part of this the worst stuff about this movie is the back and forth. Why did we need this scene again? Like uh-huh. come on. But I, yeah. it made me laugh because Milo's just naked all the time. And it, to me, it kind of was like um, that scene in uh, Bay of Love with, where Chris Aver, they talk about the scronk. Uh, oh, yeah. Or squonk. Yeah. Squonk. I think it's the squonk. Yeah, I think it's squonk. It's, but it's, it kind of reminded me of that. And that's never a bad thing. Never. So, so he finally comes to Greece and rents a car. And man, this stuff is so fun. Yes. This is my favorite shit in the movie. How Milo thinks that Father Roche is his best friend, I have no idea. Maybe he's the only one who tells him <laughs> like it is. Tell, oh, no. Tells it like it is to him. They are immediately arguing, <laughs> especially about Milo's driving. He's going to uh-huh. get them killed. It's awesome. It's he great. loses his hat. And, and, and Father Roche is like, my hat, go back for my hat. That's my best hat. And Milo's like, I hate your hat. <laughs> 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 it's awesome. It is. It's Love like it. what you're driving, you're riding in a, a convertible. Maybe you should take your hat yes. off, you know? Hey, what a concept. Milo hates right, that I'm hat. Stop. That's some bad hat, Harry, Cute. which is a quote from Star Wars. Star Wars, The Next Generation. Episode three. Roses are red, violets are blue. Light beer from Miller, I love you. You've got a third less calories than the regular beer, and really are less filling, which is something to cheer. But what I like above all the rest is the way you taste, you are the best. Yes, blue is the violet and red is the rose, and if you don't believe me, I'm going to break your nose. Like beer from Miller. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. Okay, all this shit is being crazy. Um, We keep having all these incidents where cloaked figures run in. Milo never sees them. He is so skeptical to the point of complete madness where Lori and Roche are like, dude, this shit is crazy. And Milo's like, nope, haven't seen it. Nope, I didn't see that. (laughs) (laughs) How anyone who looks like Father Ted is going to be like stoic and not into weird shit. I don't I don't get it. I I don't know, man. He yeah, he's got musk. He's got some sort of nashy musk about him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh boy it's so good um so so next up we see tom and beth and them being held by the satanists mm-hmm. by the, the minotaurists All right what is going what is going on when the minotaur speaks to the girl so um the he he tells the the minotaur tells her that uh he wants her to kill Father Roche, and then we see uh, Father Roche there in the chamber with a knife coming at his eye, you know, repeatedly, repeatedly. Yep. What they're hoping is a flash forward, obviously, uh, but it's a really, yes. it's a really cool scene. The girl that plays, yeah. the girl's really good that plays the uh, the the child that they want to kill Father Roche. That little girl is like her name's like Christina. And the actress's name is also Christina, mm-hmm. so it's one of those, you know, she's definitely a um, Madonna. Exactly. Everybody in Greece knows Christina, Christina. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that's one of my big complaints about this movie is not this scene. This scene's cool. This is the only scene that isn't like all the other ones with the, the Minotaur stuff, where the Minotaur is really repetitive with his orders and really repetitive with what he says. And whenever they go to him, if they're not sacrificing somebody, they're, the Minotaur just comes up out of the floor, blows fire, makes those proclamations, goes away. Like, I was almost expecting it to be a Wizard of Oz situation. I where, totally was. You know, Peter Cushing is controlling this this animatronic creature. Uh-huh. But no. No, I thought, I no. like, we we were far in, and I said, I asked Elizabeth, I said, do you think is this supernatural? And she said, yeah, duh, moron or whatever. And I'm like, okay. 
I'm like, well, I didn't know. I thought maybe it might have been, and that's what I said, a wizard of, wizard of the law situation where somebody's controlling yep. this thing. I'm like, but because we don't get, we don't get any motivation from a minotaur. We don't, you know, right. he just demands that you kill who comes in there. I mean, you know, that's, that's pretty easy. <laughs> you know, for a cult, it just, what is he, what is he, you know, does he give them stuff is it for the harvest? I don't, I don't know, but it yeah, also, man. it adds also to the strangeness of the film. To- totally. I almost said tootly. Tootly. Only one thing can save you now. Father Roche must die. He has entered my forbidden chamber. So things kind of hit the fan where the the black cloaked figures finally reveal themselves to Milo as well as everyone else. And there's this big fight scene and they, they find the hippies, the missing hippies van. They run over a guy. Uh, they run over Ventress, who's Ventress, who's this cop who's been like smugly watching them and denying everything that's happening. Mm-hmm. The next morning at the hotel, they can't find Lori. Lori's gone. When Vendris, who we know to be one of the members of this cult, shows up, Milo flips the fuck out. Yeah, he does. Brad, what what happens when this shit goes down? He's just decided he's not going to take any more shit, <laughs> and just goes wild. It's like he didn't he like he flew from America to Greece to yep. help the father. Immediately upon arrival, he's like, I don't believe anything you're saying, and then spends the rest of the movie actively denying that anything is going on supernatural and then finally <laughs> something happens and he's like oh i get it and it and it's on him beating the crap out of his cop lasts for quite a while it but does. then the baron good old peter cushing rolls up with a shotgun he <laughs> literally brings a shotgun to a milo fight that's right and is threatening to shoot milo and then this great standoff Donald Pleasance, you know, he's trying to d- try to uh, defuse the situation. Peter Cushing does a countdown and then literally stops time by shooting the grandfather clock. And, oh, it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful moment and probably one of the best written moments in the movie. Uh-huh. They leave. They pretend to leave. And, of course, Roche is like, yes, that's nice you have a gun, Mr. Milo. Not going to work on these people. Need to get some religious artifacts to take these fuckers down. Uh-huh. They go to a church. He gets the crucifix. He gets the, the holy water, holy water. And they head out to the layer of the Minotaur, not the land of the Minotaur to the layer. Right. And Donald Pleasant says the most baffling thing. And Leah and I were talking about it off and on today. Please tell me and us. He enlists Milo's help to get up on the the second floor of this <laughs> layer so that he can block the moonlight from getting in the window, thus letting the evil people complete their ritual because it's powered by moonlight. Okay. Okay, Brad, this is the, this is the most important question I'm going to ask you in the history of this podcast. Okay. I'm ready. What? Oh. How? How? Does Donald Pleasance block this window and the moonlight, and what effect does it have when he successfully or unsuccessfully blocks it? it so two parter. So he he climbs up it in a, in a ridiculous manner that I don't. I mean, <laughs> I don't think would have ever worked. And he gets up right. there and he blocks it, and nothing happens. He he blocks it with his body. No, he just he just stands there, right? <laughs> he just stands in the in. window. Uh, yes, I mean, 
I didn't expect him to bring like curtains and a, like a curtain rod, but like what the fuck? Nothing. He brought nothing to do this no. with. No. And what is what effect does him doing nothing have? Nothing. Exactly. <laughs> you get all of the answers right. Okay. That's so crazy. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I missed the part why he was climbing up there. All, I looked up. All I was taking notes. I looked up. He's he's like spider walking up the wall, and I'm like, why is he going? Why is he going up there? Why didn't Milo, who's you know twelve years younger, doing it? Then he gets up there, and then no, nothing happens because. They're getting ready to kill everybody. Oh, it's so good. I yeah, love it. It's really good. Well, sure, Milo tries to shoot some people. has no effect. Um, you know, Father Roche is, is waving that crucifix around. It's, it's, it's sort of having an effect. Not really. Um, everyone's about to get sacrificed. Everyone's about to die. But then that's when our boy, Donald Pleasant, starts flinging the holy water around. That's right. And all... H-E double hockey sticks breaks out. Brad, tell us about what happens at the climactic climactic of this movie. I mean, the whole cult falls apart. Um, The holy water, (laughs) and there's a fire, and they rescue whom they can, and the Minotaur just collapses. The whole whole place does. Comes down. Then there's a ridiculous final scene where they're (laughs) talking, where they're talking about, uh, Fighting evil. Yep, yep, yep. The Minotaur explodes. The place falls down. We had great effects shots where oh they my use god, the cloaks. I'm sorry. Yes, go yes, ahead. They they fill the cloaks with chunks of meat and yes. blow them up. It's almost too fast to see anything, but yes, there's some there's some bloody chunks flying. Yes, and it's the most unexpected thing in this film. I rewound it and we watched it again because it's <laughs> they just start exploding. It's so overwhelming. This whole movie is overwhelming. Was the Minotaur keeping them alive? We don't know. Maybe. We don't know. Uh, maybe they've been alive for thousands of years. Who knows? They're uh, all Greek. I mean, they're Carpathian Greek. They're Carpathian Greek. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's a thing. <laughs> and then the closing credits has the most bonkers freaking song playing. Yes, it's Paul this, Williams. Like, is that Paul Williams? Are you serious? I am dead serious. Holy shit. I, uh, because this song is completely crazy. I liked it on YouTube. It is... It's called uh, The Devil's Men, Paul Williams. Wow. And so what I should have done, I meant to go back because in the beginning, it says music by Brian Eno, and then it's got song sung by Paul Williams, but I didn't read who wrote the song, if it was Paul Williams or if it was somebody else, but it's a banger. Yeah. Yes, music by Carl Jenkins and lyrics by Carol Ann Barat. This song is like sort of prog rocky, sort of, for lack of a better term, glam rock. But if Paul Williams is involved, of course, it's going to be nuts because he always brings the craziness. Yeah, I went straight to YouTube to find it. Before we talk about how we feel about this movie, we have maybe a little bit of trivia, uh, but we're definitely going to talk about the crew behind this thing. I express apologies for my ignorance. I don't know the Greek films that are referenced here. I have not seen a lot of Greek films, um, and I definitely have not seen like anything that these other actors have been in. So, of course, if I don't mention some of the Greek producers of the film is because i just don't recognize anything that they've done not to belittle them right obviously uh but first up we've got a producer herbert g luft he's an associate producer on this movie um along with the greek people who bankrolled this beauty he produced the mutations Mm. which i don't know if you've seen it's another donald pleasant's vehicle yeah i don't (sighs) It's one of those that I might have seen as a kid. I'd have to see it now and see if yeah. I remembered it. I can't remember. It's pretty interesting. I I, I watched it on good old Joe Bob and, and enjoyed it. I don't know if I'd ever watch it again, though. Gotcha. Worth gotcha. a look. Worth a look. Uh, Nick Morrison, uh, he was the executive producer on this. 
He also executive produced uh, a classic mystery science theater 3000 film called Mitchell from just a year or two before this. Um, I shame, shamefully admit I've still never watched <laughs> the Mitchell episode of MST3K. That is a very key episode. I just have not gotten to it yet. Nice. But Brad's been chomping in the bit. He's about this one. Music. Yes. By Brian Eno. Brad, what is up with this emo Eno man? So I guess probably uh, earlier in the show, I hope Mark hasn't been fuming the whole whole show. <laughs> Brian Eno then is not Brian Eno now, obviously. Correct. So Correct. It, it's well within the realm of possibility that he could do a, a soundtrack for a, a low-budget horror film. Uh, yes. So he had been in Roxy Music and was kind of, he was the keyboardist and did treatments and whatnot. And then he broke away for a solo career. He released Here Come the Warm Jets. Yes. Um, which is a really groundbreaking album. It's glam rock, but it's the most, it's, it's, it's just different. Experimental. Yeah. Very experimental. He went on to make, have like four quote unquote pop albums in the 70s. Let's see, his second album had Third Uncle, which was covered by Bauhaus. Uh, Mother Whale oh, Eyeless. Really nice. Anyway, I like so, that one. Yes, so he is a very seminal figure in glam rock and ambient. He pretty much, I wouldn't say he invented it, but he certainly popularized ambient music. He went on to be a producer, produced for the Talking Heads. Uh, I believe yes. he produced some U2. Um, he produced a lot of people. Oh, I'm sure yeah. I'm leaving it out. Just yeah, kind of hitting the high notes. So he's he's very much on the technological edge as as well. So very very important music guy, and the soundtrack for this is fantastic. It's it's really good. I have an opposite feeling. Okay. I love Brian Eno. I love Brian Eno. This period. I do not like this score. I believe it's cool. Yeah. And effective for making me uneasy okay however he didn't make enough music for this movie there's no song yeah right there's no melody right there's 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 percussive you know like and and, you know melody can be you could say that the staccato breathy stuff he's doing is like a, a type of melody but like i jumped over to the brian eno of dario argento's opera just for my fun brain to listen to. Right. And that is like the most pop film score stuff ever. Cause even though it's spooky and strange, Brian, you know, it all has a melody that will stick with you. Sure. Whereas this feels like, um, I'm going to name drop the nerdiest shit right here. There's a composer named Elian Radige. I don't know how to say her name. A lot of the stuff she's doing is, of, that Brian Eno is doing reminds me of her stuff and her stuff is very difficult music. Like it's unsettling and hypnotic is the best thing I can say about it. And that is exactly what Brian Eno is doing here mm-hmm. is very hypnotic, but it also makes me upset. <laughs> I got you. And I just wanted more. I just, I was like, and this was like his second film score ever. I was going to say this might be one of his very, yeah. very earliest. Uh, Absolutely. What what he did do in this, I think, is, like you said, very effective because it helps build tension. He's really good at that. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, but I get what you're saying as far as melody. I know exactly what you're saying. Hey, I like how we both had a totally different feeling about it. That's freaking great. Yes, it's rare. <laughs> but we're that we both do. Brian Eno. We're both yeah, and we're both Eno nerds. I love it. I do enjoy Brian Eno. Scott Curtis bought me uh, "Here Come the Warm Jets" for my birthday. Oh, it's so good! Vinyl. What a yeah. great record. You mailed me your CDs. Do you remember this? I do. Yeah, they were the. You, uh, you sent me. <laughs> they were masters. His first, his first four albums. You mailed them to me <laughs> all the way here to Tampa, and I'm burn them and sent them back to you. And I still listen to those MP3s all the time. Heck yes. I am glad. No, I do remember because oh, yeah. they were, was all you could get. Yep. You know, was that the only remastered set? I don't know if they've remastered it since. Who knows? You know, several reissues later. 
Right. Cinematography was by Ari Stavru. He shot The Hook, the aforementioned, not so great Greek giallo, uh, which is just one of those, yeah, my husband's rich and you're my lover, kill him. Don't like it. The production company, one of the production companies was Getty Pictures. They did the mutations. So probably the production company of that uh, Luft guy. Um, right. But this was released on Interglobal Home Video, which is a label that released The Asphyx, um, which I, I've never seen that. Have you seen The Asphyx? I have seen The Asphyx. I've always wanted to see it. I've just never gotten to it. It was a long time ago. It stars uh, Robert uh, Powell. Robert Powell, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, Robert Powell. And it was an odd movie. It was a, it was an interesting premise. I felt like it was odd, but it's been so long. I'd pro- I'll I could probably have a much different opinion now. Uh, yeah. It was a long time ago, but yeah, having to do with photographs and capturing your last, I can't remember exactly how it went. Your last moment, I think. Do what? <clears throat> before you croak. Yeah, the last moment before somebody died, you could catch the ass fix on in a photo. Yeah. It's a crazy name, ass fix. It's a, the greatest metal band that ever was. It really is. Uh, they also released Sisters of Death. They released Asylum. Man. They released a, a Giallo, a Giallo under its Blade of the Ripper title. Do you know which Giallo is called Blade of the Ripper? What's what the uh, more common title for that one? Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward. Boom. Exactly. Boom. On us and Giallo, y'all. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, that's all the, that's all that's fun stuff. Um, Trivia. Yeah. Do we have any trivia? I don't think I've got any trivia. According to IMDb, so resourceful tonight. <laughs> Donald Pleasance was supposed to play the Baron, uh, but he only agreed to do the film if he could play Father Roche because he was tired of playing villains. Oh, nice. And uh, Peter Cushing supposedly filmed his scenes in one week. I would argue it probably took less time than that. I would say. <laughs> and this is where I found out that Myra uh, was uh, Myra Shore, Donald Pleasance's wife. Wow, I will have to tell Elizabeth. Yeah, she's going to love that. Because she's never going to listen to this. Yeah, she only listens to us. Yes. All right, well, how do you feel about The Devil's Men? Listen, I loved it. Not only did I love it, Elizabeth loved it. It is, we watched it late Saturday night, and it it is a great late Saturday night movie when it's just one of those, it's, it's an open book. There's no mystery, but things just dreamily kind of wander on. It's very, very atmospheric. I look forward to already to seeing it again. It reminded me of several different things. It reminded me of, like I, I talked about, it, like a Paul Nashie film in a way, uh, certain aspects of it. Uh, it also, obviously, it's got kind of a Wicker Man vibe to it in a yeah. way, kind of, sort of. But then it also reminded me in its kind of meandering way of a film that I really enjoy called Crypt of the Living Dead or uh, Hannah, Queen of the Vampires. It's one of those dreamy, you know, it just kind of flows along. And some some have accused it of being boring. And I know some have accused this of being boring or nonsensical. I think it works really well from a perspective of... Just, you know, a story being told, but you pretty much know what's going to happen. I mean, even if there had been some mystery, I suppose, about Peter Cushing, you know Peter Cushing's behind it. Maybe they just threw away the pretenses and just said, hey, we're going to tell you right out out of the gate who the villains are, because you've seen movies before, you know who it is. Uh, (laughs) Yes. But no, I think everybody did a really good job as far as... Peter Cushing and Donald Pleasance, his Irish accent kind of comes and goes. Pleasance's. <laughs> yes. Uh, he loved doing that accent. Yeah. But no, I'm really glad we watched it. I'm proud that, I, that I've got the, uh, the indicator Blu-ray. I think it's probably would be best recommended to folks who are Euro horror veterans that maybe have, have seen everything else, but maybe didn't see this because of his reputation. I don't think everybody's going to like it. I no. wanted I wanted to cover it from work, but I also really wanted to see it and ha- you know see what I thought of it myself. I actually owned it. Uh, it came with Terror, 
the Norman J. Warren's Terror. It was a double feature uh, DVD. So I owned it on DVD for uh, forever, but we just never right. watched it because I'd heard it wasn't that good. But Mark's mentioned it several times and I dug it, man. It's un, un, <coughs> kind of unintentionally hilarious at times and intentionally hilarious, <laughs> but it's all presented in just this, this just strange village this atmospheric village essentially yeah you know so yeah i really dug it cool this was my first viewing in probably 15 to 16 years Mm. i watched it for the 1976 movie thon as we talked about um i said it was boring but also too weird to be boring Mm. saturday night when i took notes on this i was exhausted i don't recommend watching this movie when you're tired right do not do not take notes on this movie when you're tired. I barely got th- I could barely read anything I wrote. It was miserable. I was I needed to go to bed and watch it the next day, but I pushed through. So my opinion of it had kind of slipped a little, and then I had it playing in the background all day today. And I laughed and had so much fun and I realized that if you're in a good mood and you're awake, this movie is a riot because you're trying to figure out what is going on one of the funniest things in the movie is they go to this funeral for one of these people who's been killed in town and they they sense some some shenanigans are going on. So Milo and Roche run off to go do their thing and Lori's like, wait, 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 what should I do? And Milo says to her, keep your eyes peeled for any more funerals. Then they leave. <laughs> and I burst out laughing like, what? Uh-huh. What did that even mean? And so there's a joke. There's actually a joke in this movie. Goofy acting, Donald Pleasant's accent, like you talked about. Our hero has the wacky swagger. He's such a dick, but he's so weird, and you can't take your eyes off him. Mm-mm. The wide-eyed actors' faces looking confused. The the awkward silences we talked about. Yes. It is a movie that goes back and forth and back and forth, like... The movie would be shorter if they cut out some of the back and forth because the back and forth accomplishes nothing. But that's the only detriment if you had to pin something down. And then I think Brian Eno should have made more music for this movie instead of depending on like the four pieces he did. It feels like only like four pieces to me. Could be it could be more than that. I might be remembering it wrong. But that's it. Other than those two things, I think this movie's great. Heck yeah. I recommend it. I really do. Yeah. I think it was a lot of fun. It's the, it, There's a lot of ramshackle charm to it. Yes. <laughs> so I got some. So Brad, I heard you have a. Yeah. I heard you have a segment. Yep. So I'm going to do something that we have not done on this show in a long time. And that is I am going to read the Land of the Minotaur entry in Terror on Tape. Oh, shit. Wow. Cushing is a Carpathian baron living on a Greek island where he heads up a cult that sacrifices beach blonde babes in hot pants <laughs> to a huge fire-breathing minotaur statue. Originally titled The Devil's Men, this prettily photographed but dull British-Greek co-production is buoyed by a dapper Peter, an amusing pleasance as a heroic priest, and an eerie Brian Eno score. Wow. So that's that's high praise for two stars. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. But also, not to Uh-oh. leave anyone with a a mere two star review, uh from Wikipedia, Chris Alexander of Fangoria Fame, it says praising the suffocating ambiance and dreamlike atmosphere as well as Brian Eno's electronic score, Chris Alexander argues that the film is underrated. Make no mistake, nice. it's a lowbrow exploitation film, but it's one that's filtered through a very stylized art house sensibility. Don't be swayed yes. by the negative mainstream reviews and general fanboy silence. <laughs> so, I mean, Chris, awesome. you know, Chris Alexander, I'm sure he, I don't know if people like him or don't like him or whatever, as far as like Fangoria I goes, I have no idea, but... I do know that uh, he's not just mainstream horror because I've seen him on like extras for your old horror films and I've seen him blurbs and things. Sure. So uh, I always like it when somebody takes up for a film 
like this. Hey, a, a common theme between both of those is that we didn't talk about how beautiful this movie shot. I mean, it really and is. all the locations. Yes. We didn't talk about the castle and the grounds of the village and just mm-hmm. like how everything is so beautifully shot. It really so is. there's points for there. Yeah, and just the whole thing is just you could wring the atmosphere out of the whole movie, uh, even nice. if even nice. if you think something is silly or whatnot, it is still it is a it's a British group co production from the mid seventies, yeah. you know, so it still yeah. carries that particular vibe anyway. What you know, whether good or hey. bad, which it's typically well, good. The older I get, the more my tastes have shifted. Where I keep a lot of movies that have boring parts. Uh-huh. Like the whole movie isn't boring. It just has a boring section like deadly manner. That movie has a lot of rambling back uh-huh. and forth, kind of boring bits. Howling three as crazy as howling three is. It has this like, Hey, you know what? Let's go on walk about, you know, we got time, you know, it's so if a movie has that energy that hooks me, I can hang with it. If they intentionally, run out of stuff to do and, and still have to fill the 95 minutes or 89 minutes or whatever. <laughs> well, let me, let me tell you how stupid I am. So let's hear it. Many, many years ago for my birthday, Elizabeth bought me the Prowler on DVD, the blue underground DVD. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we had never seen it. So, uh, we watched it and she had also bought me another film that I didn't care for. So we watched the Prowler and I'm like, that was the most meandering film I've ever seen. They wander around that house for like three quarters of the film. It seems like, and I was just, I was like, uh, that I, just, but that was just a B movie, you know. Yeah. Yep. And then, and then I don't know what happened. Maybe we watched it two or three more times, and it just finally clicked. And I'm like, I, how stupid am I? I love this. But everything about this, <laughs> just, so I mean, I I've got two Prowler T-shirts. So nice, uh, nice. But I just completely changed changed the way I I felt about it, and I don't yeah. feel that I don't feel that way about it at all. I feel stupid that I did. So yeah, you just hey, change. That's like me and Norman J. Warren's Terror, where I thought Terror sucked. Yeah, and it was dumb, and now I love oh, love gosh. Terror. It's a classic. Yes, I mean you and I covered that I think before it had a Blu-ray. Yep. Had a you DVD, did. yeah. We've covered Sweet. some great movies over the years. It's it's quite a career, and you know we get five hundred bucks for every episode. So just think how rich we are. Who uh, who is our new sponsor? The sponsor is five hundred bucks per episode dot com. I knew it. I knew. See, you're a consummate <laughs> show and slipping in the name of our sponsor into conversation <laughs> like that. I have consummated with a few showmen in my time. The blue chew thing didn't work <laughs> out, did it? No. Nah. So, folks, <laughs> before I let Brad escape this plane of podcasting existence, we pick a recently seen and loved film. It can be any genre. It can be a first-time watch, or it can be an old favorite. Brad, do you have anything for us today? Yes. Yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the one that I meant to tell you last week. And then whenever these come out years apart, you'll have to do some uh, detecting to figure out when we recorded these. The Thundering Sword, Shaw Brothers film. It is oh. very much a Romeo and Juliet wuxia, wuxia film. I don't know why I say wuxia because it, it reads that way probably. But no, it was great. The star, I always get her. I always say her name wrong, so I won't. But Chang Pei Pei, I did it anyway. Yeah, she has two role, two different roles in it. It was so good. Ooh. I loved it. I thought it was nice. fantastic. I'd watch that. Yes, you would. It was great. Awesome. What have you seen lately? Well, I think I texted you when I was watching it, which uh, watched uh, Scott Pilgrim. Yes, sir. The uh, the the good old. Uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World film, Mm -hmm. a movie I've seen many times, and I just busted it out because we needed something to watch. It's like a come-down film from a stressful week. It was perfect. Perfect. We were just talking about Scott Pilgrim the other day. Elizabeth and I, we haven't seen it in a while, and it's time. Oh, yeah. Well, that's all I got, man. 
That's all I've got. Thanks, Mark, for being such a good friend of the show. Uh, we really mean Mark. that. I hope Mark, we hit me up, man. I hope we didn't embarrass him. I hope we didn't. Uh, no. I hope we uh, yeah. did we right. Did, did the by film Mark. right. Yeah, exactly. Mark, email me, dude. I haven't heard from you in a while. So, folks, thanks for listening. Hope you're well. We're sorry if we made you unwell with our sexy ass voices. That's right. Just pull over, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>Thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you'd like to write into the show, send an email to doomedmovithon at gmail or hit us up at doomedmovithon on Instagram or at doomedmovithon on Twitter or at doomedmovithon at Discord or go to Hello This Is The Doom Show on Facebook and message us there. If you want more Hello This Is The Doom Show... Go to doomedmovithon.com and click the podcast button for the archive. Or go to YouTube and look up Doomed Movithon and you'll find the classic episodes of Hello, This is the Doomed Show. And if that's still not enough, um, I have written some books, you know, about my love of movies over on Amazon.com. Uh, just look up Richard Glenn Schmidt and you'll find Giallo Meltdown, a Movithon Diary, Giallo Meltdown 2... Cinema Somnambulist, or Doomed Movie-thon, the book. Hello, this is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Go to legionpodcast.com and check out the other great shows over there.